So I finally found that uh, I had my, my microphone inside my mask, so you were hearing every time I took a breath, <laughs> <coughs> which is not a bad thing um, that I'm still breathing, number one. But <clears throat> though I live with the fantasy of being that priest in, uh, at the beginning of the Vicar of Dibley, who, you know, during evening prayer just kind of keels over, uh, dying doing the thing you love. Uh, but breathing is what we're about this morning. I mean, we're about the idea of breathing. And I, I, I tried, I tried to, to rack my brain around something I read about Einstein um, that do forgive me, because um, I've got no scientific knowledge whatsoever in my entire being. Um, I just sort of go with the flow, basically, that, you know, whatever keeps me alive, keeps me alive, and uh, until it doesn't. And, <clears throat> and didn't Einstein go looking for that thing that filled the void? Isn't that what he was after? Uh, some of the, the, there was something in the, there in, in everything, even beyond that which we thought had nothing. And sort of, I use that as, if, if that's true, it's, it's, it's a good example. If it's not true, it would be a good example, even if it was, tr if it was true. Um, because the life of the spirit is sort of, it's, it's not just like breath. It, is, it fills everything that we do. I want to begin my sermon today uh, as I finished this morning earlier on, in the sense that I... I had a, a friend who was a priest, a very outgoing priest, an incredible uh, ex, a, 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 um, extrovert. I mean, he, he really was a Pied Piper. We all followed him wherever he went. The energy was fantastic. And so I asked him, uh, we bumped into each other at Waterloo Station in London, and I'd had an experience of the Holy Spirit that was, was different. It was unexpected that it had come upon me, uh, that some call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, for me, it had been a sort of an opening up of a very sort of uh, incredibly introverted and shy person. Um, and, and my expression of, there was an expression of tongues in that experience, which included, for me, sort of like reciting poetry in a foreign language. I mean, it was a really strange but very liberating experience. And I know that's not something that happens to everybody, but it had happened to me in that on, on a trip that I went on. Well, I get talking, I'm bumped into, um, into this priest and, and, and uh, Roger, and he's, he, he said he had had a similar, I sort of told him about this experience. He said, well, I had this similar experience. I said, well, what did you learn? I mean, he didn't need to be opened up at all. And his answer was, well, you know, I, I just realized how much of my life I kind of plan for things and strategize about things, and, and, then I, and then I ask the Holy Spirit to bless it. He says, now I just go and do my thing every day and things happen around me. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful experience to kind of know that we're, we, walk in the, we walk in the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit and... And, and even without us being necessarily, I mean, we do have to make plans. I'm not saying we don't make plans. But what if we had a real, things just fit into place as we went? I, I count my coming here as a gift of a call of the Spirit, um, certainly for me. And the more I'm here, the longer I realize that, that the incredible community to which God has, has, has sent me. And that it's just more perhaps about the reviving of my own soul than maybe anything that I offer to you. So we breathe, we're invited to breathe, to make us our very spiritual breath, this life, this, this living in this immense, immense gift of the Holy Spirit. And I know for some reason you have... Uh, this is a great day for you. This is a day you, you look at you, you all wear red, you're wearing red as best you can. And uh, there's, there's really, my, if my wife was here, she'd just have one thing to say, and that would be not enough hats. <laughs> and if she had been here for a few weeks, she might have been able to prepare you for that, you know. 
We have, I don't know whether it's a national group, but we do have in Iowa a group called the Red Hat Club. What is it? It's the Ladies Red Hat Club, right? And you, I never saw them in Cali Southern California, but I did see them popping up all over in Iowa, all these uh, luncheons and ladies in red hats. Well, you know, uh, Donna makes jester hats, so even men could wear hats of red uh, and, and flat caps, actually, those wonderful little um, Elizabethan flat caps she makes. She could, and all of those could have been in red. We could have all had red things on our hats today. Not just, I brought my red hat today. <laughs> Uh, in honor of her, really, but no, it's because of those two little spikes, which if you wear the hat the wrong way and become rabbit's ears, you know? Well, they're really, it's meant to be flames of fire, and I'm, I'm, under, I'm underplaying the flames of fire uh, for you all today, because I know that's not, that's not something we're, we're, we like to play about um, in this neck of the woods, literally. The disciples didn't know what it was Jesus told them to wait for. He didn't, they didn't know. Um, they, were on, uh, they were just obedient. They had seen enough of miracles in their time. They had seen people raised from the dead like Lazarus. They had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And somehow they had learned that the very same spirit of God that had raised Jesus from the dead would be theirs. Jesus talked about this advocate that would come and be with them. And they would not be left alone, but then Jesus left them and they were alone. And one day left, went for another. Soon they were like nine or 10 days alone. And one feast of the, old, uh, of the Hebrew people, uh, the feast of, pa of Passover was now being replaced by another feast, the feast of weeks or the feast of Pentecost. The seven weeks since the harvest began to the finishing of the harvest when people would then bring the first fruits of that harvest to the presence of God. And at the same time, it was thought that that was also a ceremony of God's gift to people of the law. And so the giving of the law for which we can be righteous people was also celebrated at the time of Pentecost. How significant was that? That at that time, when, when the disciples might think, well, we're, we're moving on through the liturgical year of the Jewish year. You know, and Jesus said, well, we have to wait. So we did wait. And then they began to hear the rumbling. We hear, when we hear rumblings in Iowa, you know, eventually people will say, well, it was like a train coming through the room. And it's a tornado. The wind and rumblings thunderous sounds. And soon they were all of them sort of swept around. And, and the thought that came to me as I think about, thought about it this time was probably they were somewhat knocked off their balance. We somehow think that it was like a gentle breeze that came through. Well, I don't think it was a gentle breeze. I think it was a rushing wind. And maybe they were knocked off balance. And I thought, what an image that is of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Though the Holy Spirit is actually coming to knock us off balance of this ordered life of ours where we want everything to be planned and to be strategized. And God forbid that Jesus comes on the day that I've got my special group. God forbid the Spirit of God should tell me on my way to a church meeting that I'm to help somebody in need. You know, Mother Teresa would do that. She would go to a conference, be the main speaker of a conference, and then have to apologize that she didn't get there because on the way she met someone who needed her help. The Spirit of God was not on the same wavelength as the organizers of the meeting. The question is, do we want that kind of life? That's how the Spirit of God moved the church from being what it was to what it is today. And we're continuously, even to this moment, involved in the same process. So none of us can hear, sit here and tell exactly what the next steps of this community is about. Because it's all about the Spirit will guide if we truly desire the Spirit to guide and can lead us. This gift of the Holy Spirit, it took the disciples by surprise. 
And then there they were, all out in the streets, talking these foreign languages that even they couldn't understand. And all I want to present to us today in terms of that is that whatever my prayer for all of us is that whatever you hear, whatever you are thinking, whatever happens today as we gather in this place and as we gather in our living rooms or wherever we are listening to this to the, and engaging in this service, that somehow God will speak to us in a way that we understand. Because we've all got our own languages. You know, I once went to a visit to a church up in northern Iowa, and, and I thought I'd really done a really good job clarifying about something they had asked a question about. And I got back to the office, and the phone rang, and uh, one of my uh, associates sort of answered the phone and was starting to talk, and I discovered it was the same group of people I'd just been with. And I, I said to him, well, I was just there, and I explained it all to them. And they said, yeah, they had a lovely visit. But they didn't understand the word you said. It's that English thing, you know? Well, the Holy Spirit does understand the words you think. The Holy Spirit does understand the life in which you, which you live. And I believe the Holy Spirit is able to speak to you. And my prayer is that today the Holy Spirit will speak to you in a way that you understand. Maybe through my words, but maybe not. I was once interrupted in the middle of a, um, a service by an organist. <laughs> and I had asked for questions, you know, but I didn't expect the organist to get up. And he said, well, what about the old Holy Spirit then, he said. We don't give them much press. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, there's only one line in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus has a couple of lines. God the Father has a couple of lines. There's all this other stuff. I said, well, what is that other stuff? There's the one line that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But I said, but what is the other stuff? I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Well, how do you think the link of the Apostles and today comes about? Who guides that? Who directs that? Who affirms that? How do you think we kept one even when we're so different and across, across uh, oceans and continents over time with all the things that we've decided to do in Christ's name that have never been anything close to Christ's spirit? How has the Holy Spirit still maintained the church as one holy, separated unto God and universal church? When Jesus arrived in the upper room, did he not breathe on the, on the disciples in John's gospel and say to them, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever's you hold back on are held back. Which is a phrase I don't understand what that means. But, you know, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the communion of saints. People who at their baptism have all been told they are sealed by God, sealed by the Holy Spirit in their baptism made whole for God, that others cannot interfere with the presence of the Spirit within you. Communion of saints, of holy ones, and who prepares us for the life to come? Who is that extension of life from this life to the next life? We often say it's our spirit, joining God's spirit, giving eternal life. The Holy Spirit is essential absolutely everything that we are as children of God, makes us children of God according to Romans, no longer just, just servants, but we are children of God, adopted, born of the Spirit. There are all kinds of things the Spirit does to us. The Spirit calls us, some to priest, some to deacon, and all of us to something. In Paul's letters to Romans and Ephesians, he has a whole list of things. He talks about people whose gift in the community is to be a helper, to provide helps. Someone who fixes all of this, helps us to sort of stream, uh, stream things uh, into people's homes 
when we weren't able to come and even now to continue to do that. People who know how to fix the water pipes, people who know how to create a barbecue, people who can help in all so many ways, people who administer, keep us from being able, bumping into each other by, by ordering the way our lives are and offering us helps in, in, in terms of administration. People who encourage one another, Paul says, is a gift of the spirit. Those that sort of always lift us up to, to greater ideas and greater concepts of ourselves and of our future than we could possibly imagine. Those people, are, that's a call of the spirit. People who are generous, people who helped put together this beautiful fra uh, framework and of, of, a, of a place in worship and, and in fellowship that we have here in, uh, on this campus. Along with the prophets, along with the priests, along with the teachers who we celebrate today, along with all of the apostles, all the people that we call churchy. There's a whole range of the spirit at work that is far beyond things just related to church and its organization and its worship. And that's the life that we're invited to live and walk by. When we live that life, it's not just about call, not just about function and gift in that sense, but there's something even more important about life in the spirit that we definitely need to demonstrate in our age today. See, Paul talks about gifts in Ephesians and Romans. He talks about fruits in Galatians. And there must have been something about the Galatian community that kind of made Paul a little, uns a little off balance. You know, they had, they had uh, you know, started, their life started together through his ministry and he had left them and gone away. He came back and he found that they had found some old ways of being. They had brought some legalistic thinking into their, into their lives. They'd brought different ways of what, what you know, some of the kosher, kosher rules of diets had sort of come back into their lives. And, and, and this was not the freedom that he felt life in the spirit really offered to us as Christian folk. And so he asked them, did you believe when you believed, did you receive the spirit? He didn't take it for granted. He said, you know, did you believe? And the understanding was, yes, you did. And then his call is so live by the spirit, live according to that way. And he goes on and maybe this was the real telltale sign for him. Because when people start to live by rules and people start to live by the way it has always been, when people start to do that kind of thing and treat each other according to those principles, what do we do? Well, we get judgmental. We get a little angry with people that don't abide by it. We get impatient. And Paul says, those are not fruits of the spirit living in you. Those are fruits of your own flesh, your own self-centeredness. So not fruits of the, of the spirit. The fruits of the spirit are things like kindness and generosity and meekness and humility and peacefulness and patience and long suffering and, and love. Above all love. And when that's practiced and manifest in the relationships everybody has with each other and not only within the church, but also especially beyond when people come into your orbit, and that's the sort of, that's the fruitfulness of, of your vine, as it were. That's the grapes hanging off of your vine. I've only been here three weeks, but I'm getting the lingo. <laughs> when those are the fruits hanging off your vine and people sense it, then there's an openness, a greater openness to what it is you might then witness to the good news of God in Jesus Christ. So life in the spirit is about our calling. It's about our giftedness. It's about all of those things. It's also about how we're born, how we grow, how we grow. And that's for every age. And the more curmudgeon you get as you get older, the more you need to pay attention to asking for the fruits of the spirit to grow in you.
My rector used to say, as I was a curate, he used to take his vestry off every year, and you couldn't actually be on vestry in his, you know, he really wanted you to be on this, this, this retreat that he would send us on. And for a day and a half of a two day or three day, three, two and a half day retreat, when all of us were anxious to sort of get going on the stages and the prints of the, the steps of, of the mission of the church for the year, he would just spend a year, day and a half and all he would have us do is answer a question. And the question was always an adaptation of, base, of a basic one, which was, when did Jesus become more than a word for you? When did he step off the page? When did he step off the page? Jesus expects to step off the page, let me tell you. One of my favorite verses in John 5, the Pharisees come to him and they have a conversation about him, about eternal life. And they say, you know, we search the scriptures to find eternal life. And Jesus says, you do right to do that. You do right. But the scriptures speak of me. And then he says, but you don't come to me that you might have life. John was very much con absolutely convinced that there was an extra step everybody had to take in becoming in relationship with God. It was that extra step of, yeah, Jesus is in the word. Jesus is all over our prayer book. He's in our liturgy. We say the words, we say it right. And we're asked also to take the extra step of coming to him that those very words are also life-giving. The Spirit is the life-giving part of God. Breathed over the creation and made creation happen and breathes over us to make our new life of the Spirit happen. So my prayer for us today is to think about these things, to make this day in which we celebrate in our redness, in our joy, in our barbecue, in our tradition, a day that truly is your birthday, truly is a day when something new has sparked within you because God and Jesus has become more than a word to you has become communicated by the spirit who has knocked you off balance. Amen.